11, 2014. My name is Nancy Nolan Jones, and I am the oral historian for the collection Reflections of Black Life in Greater Cleveland. We're here today with an interview with Bill Payne. He's graciously agreed to share his story with us, and we're very excited to get started. Billy, take us back and tell us your birth date. Give us some background. Where you were born, birth date. I was born in a little town down the middle part of Ohio, back in the country, in uh, 1928, what April the 3rd. Name? Sio, S-C-I-O. It was right near Caddis, which was a county seat. <clears throat> we had some characters born there. General Custer was born only a couple of miles away from there. I played with some of his nephews and really? uh, older and uh, Keith Custer and Bob and all of them. And uh, also, uh, uh, it was uh, the county seat, Caddis was 14 miles away, was, they claimed Clark Gable because they were the county seat. He was only a couple of miles from there. Okay. And also Bill Payne was born there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. was a good thing. Yeah. And that was in 1923. What was the 28. Month? 28. Don't make, don't make it worse than it is, kid. <laughs> what was the month? April 3rd. April 3rd. 1928. So tell me, who were your parents? Give me their names. My dad was a man, Brady Payne, come out of uh, Alabama, lived into uh, Oklahoma following his father for a while. And my mother was named was Rosenia, R-O-C-E-A-N-I-A, -E McDonald. I haven't said these names in so long, I mean, I, I stutter on them, see? <laughs> yeah, and uh, she was, uh, her and her mother was named Morgan, Fanny Morgan, and she married a man by the name of McDonald, Alec McDonald. Fanny Morgan married somebody? Uh, Alec, Alec, Alec McDonald, okay. no, Alec McDonald. McDonald. Okay. Yeah. Where, where were... Where um, was Fanny and Alec? Where were they living? They lived, uh, they were from Tennessee. Okay. Then they moved into Texas. And uh, the reason they came into Pittsburgh, because a friend of his told my grandpa that in Ohio, he said it reminds you so much of Tennessee because they were all leaving the South at that time. The black people were, you know. And uh, most of them. Tell us why were they all leaving? Oh, racial problems. You know, because in the South, whether you're white or black in the South, if you have nothing, you are nothing. <laughs> That's the way they feel. If you're a black man and you have something, you're somebody. Okay. You know, you'll find that true in the South. I think them. It's fair in saying that. But anybody else, you were. And the treatment was bad. Naturally, it was bad because of prejudice of the white man in the South against blacks. Mm -hmm. You remember, we came from slaves, see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, had nothing to fight for for the country. Didn't know where to go. Hardly knew where North, East, South, or West was. Not like the American Indian. This was his country. They couldn't enslave him, you know. Right. But when you're thousands of miles away from your country, Africa, wherever you came from, Europe, and uh, it's hard to start aloof or, uh, again or make a, a rebellion of any sort. Because mm -hmm. you saw what happened, what was it, to Nate Turner? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Racine, Racine? Rosina. Rosina was from Tennessee. Yes. And... Um, what do you know what her family did there? Were they farmers? Farmers? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Alec's father was a man by the name of Cos McDonald. He was biracial. And uh, his mother, father, came from Madagascar and moved into the United States, or the Americans. And uh, they had about I'm not sure, but they had about six children, six. And uh, 
one of my grandfather's sisters was a smith here in Cleveland. She uh, married a man by the name of Smith that owned a printing shop down on Quincy, up there near, near uh, 92nd. And, uh, now, who was this? That was Smith. Yeah, but... That was my grandfather, Alec McDonald's okay. sister. Okay. And she married a Smith. Okay. And he had two boys, uh, Bruce and... Uh, they were both musicians too, and he had a printing press there, and a barber shop. Hal. Pardon? Was his name Hal? No. Um, Hal Smith. Hale. Hale. Hale Smith. Yeah, Hale Smith. See, it's been so long since I thought about. It. I got to think back, <laughs> and I forgot a lot of these. Well, not forgot them, but yeah. they're just. We'll bring back up memory. Yeah. And uh, that's the reason I have to stop and think a while sometimes when you ask me something. And, and I'll stutter <laughs> trying to get it, you know. Okay. And uh, Hale was a very smart man. And also, he had a... Was it him or his brother? Hale was the composer. Oh, that was young Hale. Mm -hmm. But his dad that owned a barber shop was a senior. He was their father. Okay. Yeah, Hale. And Bruce was... Young Hale's junior brother. Right. And they could run that lino type machines for the press right there. And he made up cards and things like that. And a straight Republican. <laughs> he was. Because <laughs> yeah. we used to go in there and argue with him all the time. You know? Yeah. But uh, they were all people that made something. You know, they, they weren't anybody that dragged their feet. And I mean, they made their way. And, made a good life for their families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Rosina's husband, his name is again? Brady. Brady. B -R -A -D -Y. Brady Luther Payne. Okay, and to that union, how many children were born? Five. And do you, can you tell me their names? Oh, sure. The oldest one was Sequoia, S-E-Q-U-O-Y-A-H. They get mad when you spell it another way, okay. <laughs> uh, like the Americans do. And then there was Brady. Uh -huh. And then there was Reuben. Uh -huh. Then there was Vivian Anna Morgan Payne. I used to call her all those names I, every time I called her. Vivian Anna Morgan Payne. Oh, <laughs> and then uh, there was two years between all of them. And I don't think they decided to have me because there's four years. <laughs> okay. And I was born, uh, as they always said, when I was 70 years old, my brother would say, hey, this is my younger, this is the baby, my baby brother. Yeah. And I'm 70 some years old. <laughs> I just, but you accept it, you know. And I guess in a way, because see, we had to mind the older kids in those days. Mm -hmm. Because we were left alone, there was no such thing as... Uh, not trusting them, you know. They knew how to get us ready for school. Mm -hmm. The parents were out for working. If we were younger and small, we darn sure washed up every morning, you know, to go to school and mm -hmm. made sure we took our baths on s Saturday night, you know. <laughs> so what, what was the town where you were born again? Sio, S-C-I-O. Now, what... And it then, was a pottery town. And from there you moved to? We moved to so many different places because my people were restless. Or at that time, maybe it was just hard. I don't know what it was. But by the time I hit uh, nine years old, I wound up, we wound up in Pittsburgh. And when we all five of, of us were together, we would jump from Ohio to Pittsburgh, Ohio to Pittsburgh, back and forth. Before I was nine years old, or by the time when I went to Old Miller Street School in Pittsburgh, I was in 14 different grade schools. Some of them I was in twice. One I was in three times, the one in Sio. I started the school there. Mom put me in the, there was no kindergarten, 
But she was working in the small town. Everybody knew anybody. And she took me over. I was about four or just turning five. And could she put me in the first grade with the kids? As there was nobody babysitting then in the rest of the And uh, the teacher said, yes, if he can keep up. Well, not bragging, but I kept up. And I was showing the kids in the first grade how to bounce balls and everything else, you know, because we were all, the, the whole family, they were very athletic. You know, because my dad was. So what, what type of work did your mom do? Housework. Okay. Yeah, she worked for a lady in Sio named Miss Thompson mm -hmm. for years. There were two sisters that lived there for years. And uh, we went to uh, the regular church over in Sio. There was no, uh, no school for the blacks, no school for the white in that part of Ohio. You all went together? All, everybody went together. But 14 miles from there, in Caddis, they had a black school and a white school. It's 14 miles. That was the difference between the two towns. And when they put the new principal in, I think it was about 1936, we were in the country then. Uh, my dad came home one day. He said, you know, that new principal up in Caddis is going to be all right. Because he asked the board when they, he took his uh, principalmanship, or whatever they gave him there, they asked him, he said, do those kids down over the hill in the school belong to the board here? He said, yeah. He said, then move them up. He moved them up to the school, the main school. And then from there on. It was integrated. It was integrated. There was no resistance? Oh, no, no, no resistance. And now you go there, you see more brown babies, <laughs> more brown babies as much almost as you do white babies because they, everybody knew everybody. White and black, after they broke down the barrier, the racial barrier, yeah. white and black were like brothers and sisters. And you'll find in that part of Ohio, Zanesville, you might be talking to a, uh, a black guy, or a white guy, rather, and you'll say, look at that black guy over there. I mean, you guys will let him move in a neighborhood or something, and then you might get hit right in the mouth because the white guy is their cousin. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, all to uh, New Rum, uh, not New Rumbley, uh, Zanesville, Yorksville, all down in through there. It's almost like a new race okay. down there. So you didn't, you didn't face the, the severity of, of segregation like the South experienced. Oh, no, no. We, as long as you were, did something and you were something, you were okay. And we would, uh, and I, I'm not bragging about this, but the pains, they didn't take anything. None of my brothers did. And if I took anything, if somebody called you a nigger or something like that, you punched them in the mouth, you know, or you had a fight. My brother, that's how he got Sequoia. That's how he got his nickname, Bo, because they were playing ball. The guy told my dad about it, playing ball. A white fellow was talking to my dad. He said, it was so funny. He said, Bo had a low voice, see, and some kid called him. Uh, Sambo, and they got into it, the fight. Mm -hmm. Bo whipped him up pretty bad, but he never got mad at him because he was always kind of evil. I mean, not evil, but not evil person, you know. Mm -hmm. He would be very calm. And the guy said, Bo looked at him after and says, you can call me Bo, but don't you call me Sambo. And he said, from that day on, everybody in Sai always called him Bo. Really? Yeah, and that's how they know him down there, mm -hmm. Bo Pain. No yeah, and if anybody hears this from that part of the country, they'll know Bo Payne. Wow. Yeah, because he was a... So Sequoia? It was Bo Payne. It was Bo Payne. Yeah, and he made the varsity basketball team when he was uh, a junior, uh -huh. his first year. Uh -huh. He was a four-year letter man. He stood about five foot nine, about the same as I did. And in those days, six foot was your center. If you were six foot, you were the center. But those guys were fast. Now the, the men are big and fast. Mm -hmm. See, so uh, they were just uh, good athletes. They right. even broke a, you had to buy your own track shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, the school didn't supply them, mm -hmm. or the school board. And if you didn't have them, you ran in tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. Him and another black kid named Wade Johnson and a farmer uh, kid, uh, can't think of his name right now, white kid, and another one. The four of them broke a relay uh, track 
running. I think it was the uh, the big relay. I don't know what. I did know the time that they ran that in, and three of them were in tennis shoes. No the only f one that was in the track shoes was a farmer who was his dad was affluent, and he bought him some track shoes. No kidding. Yeah, those guys could have set records down there a long time ago, and that record stood for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now you're in you're in Sio. What what took you to Pittsburgh? <laughs> Two or three times. What took me to Pittsburgh? <laughs> <laughs> the first time. Uh, we lived in the country. I guess the, my granddad bought a farm because it looked like Tennessee in Ohio. And he never used it, but my mother moved into it. Ah. And down on that farm, around in that area, is where I was born. Okay. You, you know what? Let me pause there because I don't think I got your grandfather's name. Ellick. Ellick, okay. Ellick McDonald. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I just needed to clarify that. Oh, okay. Okay. Alec McDonald. Huh? Oh, yeah. I, I did get it. Oh, my birth, yeah. April 3rd, 1928. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so Alec was married to who? Fanny Morgan. Fanny Morgan. Now, do you know where they were born? In Tennessee. In Tennessee, okay. Because his dad was named Cos McDonald. His dad was supposed to have been uh, a German, Koss's dad, and I be, believe his name was Klaus. So McDonald, Alec McDonald's name, his father was? Klaus, uh -huh. and he took the name McDonald I by a slave, owner, a slave owner that bought him out of Tennessee. I mean, not, I'm sorry, out of... Uh, Alabama? No. It was out of, uh, hold on, over in Virginia. Lynchburg? I don't know. It was in Virginia. And he was bought back by the slave buyers and that over the mountains, the trace they called it, down in the, through the Cumberland Gap and all in through there. And he said the first weapon he ever got as a slave was he went out, they sent him to gather up firewood. And he gathered up a lot of green wood and smoked out the whole camp. <laughs> he said they, they whipped him, you know, for it. Yeah. And this was Klaus? This was Klaus. Wow. And like I said, I think his, and he had a twin brother. Mm -hmm. And when the slave trader came through, he had a twin brother by the concubine of this doctor, see. But when his father was away, when uh, Dr. Klaus was away, his mother was, his wife, rather, was a little bit, they said, on the jealous side, and she sold those boys because Klaus had a twin. They don't know what happened to the twin. They couldn't find him. Mm. So she sold Klaus, Koss, rather, because I think it might have been from accent of the South because most of the black people and people around there called him Koss, Koss McDonald. Okay. See, but he was definitely uh, biracial. And uh, he was a light-skinned man, very light, tall, and he had a beard and wild eyes. That's all I remember. <laughs> and you can remember him? So that was your great-grandfather? Uh, no. I never saw Klaus. Okay. But he was living when I was born. Oh. Yeah. And he was bought by somebody in Tennessee, McDonald, mm -hmm. and he took the name of McDonald. Because before then, his name, and I might not have the right uh, pronunciation of it, it was Koss Zonklin or something like that. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure. And then uh, Koss, Koss, Koss? Well, we always say Koss. Okay, Koss <laughs> had a son who was Alec McDonald. That's it. They and married Fanny. And he married Fanny. Fanny Morgan. Morgan. And her dad... He looked like a white man. Mm -hmm. And he said the first thing he could remember, his dad, he never knew his mother. And his dad was crossing a stream. And he was on the back of the horse in Tennessee. And he said that's the first thing he can remember, as far back as he could remember. And he was a Morgan. This is Fanny's father. What, what's Fanny's father. Bob Morgan. Okay. Wow. And he was a what did they give in? Not uh, Laden was a dope. 
Laden was a dope then. You drink it like they dope up people now. He was a dope head having he grown old, you know. He had so much of that stuff that my granddad, uh, Alec, wouldn't let him in the house sometimes, you know. And you couldn't tell him from a white man, which is so many, happened so much in the South, yeah. you know. In those days, you know, they're gone now. But you couldn't tell them. And the ones that are still there, they're either going for white or else they're, everybody knows who they are. Right, right, right. Yeah. Wow. Well, that gives us a good background for the family who wants to look at that. Let's move forward a little bit with this to hear a little bit more about your life as you're growing up. Um, with your brothers and sisters, you um, were in Pittsburgh and then you were back to Ohio. Ohio. In Pittsburgh again, my parents owned a little hotel out on Frankstown Avenue. And then one night, we moved from there. Back to Ohio in a truck. Stayed in what I call, we called houses by the color. In the yellow house. Okay. And it's still standing. Is it? Yeah, right, right up to the cemetery. Wow. was up above it. I used to see funerals go by all the time when they went that way. They got a new way to get there now because when you went so far up that hill, you turn and it was very high and slippery. In the wintertime, a lot of them couldn't make it up to the graveyard, you know what I mean? So they got another way of going up there now. But uh, it was, uh, and I lived across the street at that time. That's where I broke my arm. And I guess at that time, when I first moved into the Yellow House, uh, from the uh, country, we were, uh, I had to be about four. And that's where I had my arm broke, because my brother made a swing down over the, into the gully, one of a tire swing, and I tested it. And he got me in it, and he gave me a big push. And I got scared when I went up in the air, and I let go, <laughs> came out, it's a wonder it didn't kill me, came out of that thing, and I fell and busted my arm. Well, Mom was working at Miss Thomas, mm -hmm. the Thomases. He knew something was wrong, you know, because I couldn't move it and it hurt when I moved it. And he put me on his back and he ran about a mile over into town to Mrs. Thompson's to tell to mom, you know, he carried me piggyback on his, on his um, back. Okay. Uh -huh. And she took me up to old Doc Scott and he said it. It was busted. Wow. Yeah. So that was the, the doc in the community. Oh, yeah, old doc Scott. the hospitals and, and all of oh, the no, oh, specialists. No. And My brother came down that hill once, Reuben, uh -huh. came down that hill once, and he was, had a stick. And I don't know why it was in his mouth, but he jammed it back into the back of his throat and couldn't get it out. My mother opened it up, his mouth. She got it out of there, and she painted that throat. I don't know what she put in there. But she painted it with a cotton swab. No hospital. Wow. Because <laughs> he was breathing like a stuck hog. <laughs> when he, yeah, and got hard. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. you had to be damn near dead for it to go to a hospital. Yeah. And sometimes you didn't make it. Wow. Because she, my broken arm, uh -huh. when it came out, you know how when it's in a cast, your arm is stiff? She bathed my, I never forgot it, because I use a concoction today. I've used it on horses. Oh, really? Yeah. She takes Epsom salts and vinegar. You have to have the Epsom salts and the vinegar together. Mm -hmm. And she bathed that arm every day, hmm. every day like that. And, and the it, wasn't Well, it left after a while. When I can remember, I remember hauling down to my dad, hey, dad, look. And I could move my fingers in that, you know, and see this scar here? My sister has one, too, on that hand, where she burned it, Vivian. Uh -huh. And uh, it's still there today. You can tell it was bad, uh -huh. OK? I don't know whether you want me to turn it to the camera or not. If you, you, know, you probably can't see it, because like you said, I'm 86 now, so it's just about browned in the sunlight and everything. Yeah. But my dad, my sister was going to give me a spanking. We didn't throw away chairs in those days. If a chair back broke off of a chair, you use it as a stool. Okay. <laughs> and we were near an old pot belly stove, and it was red hot. And she's going to spank me and throw me over the chair, her lap. And when she did, I'm fighting her because she was four years older than me. And I, you know, and I throwed my hand 
up against this stove and you talking about listening to it fizz, <laughs> it's a <laughs> Oh my God. My dad, every day, he would change that bandage and he would grease it with something. I don't know what he greased it with, but I don't know. And to keep it from hurting me so much, he used to make me up eggnog for me to drink. And that was a treat, eggnog. Every day I look forward to the bandage because I was getting a glass of eggnog, right, you know. Right. And uh, he, uh, he doctored it back. And by the same token, that they, token, they could do stupid things. Not my parents, but other people could do stupid things. My sister burnt her hand. She was staying with my aunt, my dad's sister. Mm -hmm. And she come from the south to Alabama, naturally. And, but she heard that when you burn yourself, you hold your hand near the heat, and it will draw the burn out. And she made her burn worse than it was. Her burn, her burn stands up now even today on the back of her hand. And, you know, that wasn't, she'd have done better just putting it under cold water and letting cold water run right, on it, right. you know. But, uh, Some no. people knew good remedies and some people didn't. Didn't, yeah, sure. Wow. And they, and just, they just didn't take you, well, they didn't have the money, right. actually. So I'm, I'm hearing you say that... Um, you were back and forth, so what were, the, what were the most pronounced skills that you think that you learned when you were younger growing up? We learned everything just about, and we were good at it. I was even good at it, you know, at my young age being the youngest. We learned how to do things, and I grew to be a jack of all trades. I had good mechanical ability. It sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm no. not. I'm just telling the truth. Right. I was musically inclined. I uh, learned to play a guitar at eight by myself in the country. At eight years old? Yeah, yeah. My brother played, and I looked at what he did, and I played it. I was good at uh, talking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so many different, and I never perfected a one. I used to think, and I still do, uh, that it was a sin with all the talents that I did have, like I said, again, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. Just tell her what I know and I tell the truth. If you want to call it bragging, call it bragging. I never really perfected. I was a good athlete. When they told me, I, they picked up a heart murmur on me as a, in Pittsburgh. When I went to Old Miller Street School, I never went to another school after Miller Street School, but I'd been there twice. Really? Yeah. So what grade did you go to at that time? Well, the first time I went in the fourth grade. And when I, no, yeah, fourth grade. And we went back to Ohio. Then I came back with mom. Mom and dad separated. I came back with mom. And she moved into the Hill District. And the second time I went back, I was in about the uh, fifth grade. Okay, so then from then on, I went straight from there down to Fifth Avenue High School on the uh, 7th. And being ahead a little bit because of, the, of uh, being starting in kindergarten early, mm -hmm. I went there in the 7th grade. I think I had just turned 11. Oh. And that, I think that's a little early. Is that mm -hmm. the right age to go in the 7th? Yeah. Um, a little bit. Maybe a year or so. And I don't know whether it was because I was never settled down or never into any one place like a parent. I don't blame my parents because my older brother said mom and dad could have did better for, by us. He's the oldest one, Bo. Mm -hmm. I said, did you ever think that maybe they did their best? I said, their best, and I'm younger than him, 10 years younger. Mm -hmm. I said, their best is not your best. Right. I said, they did the best that they thought they could do. Right. It just wasn't for them. Right. And they were both a little ahead of their time. My mother was definitely ahead of her time. In which way? In learning things. Uh, she had more education than my dad. She was an independent woman. You wouldn't, wasn't going to keep her happy sitting by the fireside. Mm -hmm. Mom was out doing something all the time. Mm -hmm. My dad was very laid-back, calm guy. When you yeah. say she was out doing something, just tell me what that might have been. 
uh, neighborhoods uh, with something going on in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. People would come to her. Mm -hmm. And that's how she got the name Miss Ann. Oh. <laughs> Nobody in, in the Hill District knew her as Rosinia. Okay. They all knew her as Miss Ann. Ask Miss Ann, you know. Okay. And she was a businesswoman. She had a few cleaners around there and everything. She had cleaners. Else. Yeah, and she had an old tea room she had started. Her and her friend, Aunt Rose, we called her. wasn't our aunt, but we called her Aunt Rose. Rose Broadus mm -hmm. was her name. And they both started out as waitresses mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh after she separated from my dad. And uh, she was a reader all the time, you know. And all of my grandmother's children, Fanny, mm -hmm. they were all very smart. Her sister, that was just a year or two younger, graduated from Pitt in 1936. Wow. And she had a master's degree. She got her master's degree and couldn't find a job teaching in Pittsburgh. She had to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana to get a teaching job mm -hmm. in those days. That was in 1936. Wow. There wasn't a black streetcar conductor, but still, Black and white got along. Yes. See? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I went to school with white kids, black kids. Our Fifth Avenue was about 50-50. Mm -hmm. There was a girl, Anna Hudak, I remember her name. She was in my grade. There was a girl named uh, uh, Jewish, Jewish kids, a lot of Jewish kids. You know who the best basketball players were? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the black kids, not like it is now. It was the Jewish kids. Really? Because they belonged to the Irene Kaufman Settlement. And they had all kind of arts right in the black neighborhood because they lived very close to the blacks there, you know, uh, all the kids did. They taught all the arts mm -hmm. in there, in the Irene Kaufman Settlement. Mm -hmm. We used to stand up on when they give a play, they had a street up above the out outdoor theater, and we would stand up there and look through the screen down onto the uh, um, stage show and listen to the plays. But we were not allowed in the Irene Coffin Settlement. See. And those kids learned to play basketball, those Jewish kids, 5'7", five, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, and I mean, we had the championship. You ask anybody. There was a kid named Bunker Stein, Jewish kid. And uh, I, he was maybe about a year or so older than me. Was a terrific basketball player. Up in the projects, they mixed that white and black. Terrace Village number one in Pittsburgh. Uh, black and white played together. Kids. There was a kid named Jack Shanafelt. Shanafelt. Jack Shanafelt, that was his name. Jack could throw further than any kid up there in Terrace Village one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And there was one kid named Scott, Alfonso Scott, black kid, a good friend of mine. And uh, his brother was Praise Gainer. Praise had the first motorcycle. That was, was that your it, first interest in the motorcycle? Everybody's first interest yeah. is to ride a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, his brother, Scott, was looked a lot like me. People used to think we were brothers, but we, you know, was no relation. But uh, he was a good friend of mine. He was my age. He was a terrific athlete. He could play ball. My my close friend, Milton Leonard. Milton was a good in sports and anything that you put him in. Football, he could throw a football. He was good. There was a kid named Spooky. That's all. I forgot what his right name was. We called him Spooky. He was about five. Anyway, he was a small guy. He could play shortstop. He should have went professional. But the only thing that was open were black teams. Okay. You know, and Spooky was small. But they should never have passed him up if he ever had to try it out for it. I don't know. Because he was a shortstop out of this world, you know. And like that, there was a lot of talents that went to waste in those days. Just a waste. That's how they got on hold of uh, And when they were good, they joined the Black League baseball players. Mm -hmm. like, and I knew uh, one or two of those guys. Mm -hmm. So, so... If we can fast forward just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. Because that really gives us a good view or concept of what growing up for you was like. Oh, yeah. You know, um, yeah. And, and I want to move forward just a little bit yeah. and uh, talk about 
getting into the middle part of your life, you got married. What, 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 give me a little bit about that transition from growing up to married life. Well, I wasn't growing. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the, uh, finished the 11th grade, and I was dragging my feet. I give credit to my 7th grade teacher, Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown made me, from the dumbest kid, she had general science. She kept me every day after school until I was the smartest kid in her room. I got to, she turned this light switch on for me. But I didn't keep it up. As a matter of fact, I messed around so much in high school that I didn't make good grades. She's the only one that opened a switch light. I was a good artist. And Mr. Tom was his name, and he was a, he had the right name because he thought that black kids, he was a school counselor, mm -hmm. should only go for, not college, take a general course, things like that. One of my, first time I fell in love was a girl named uh, Delester DeWitt. I saw her when she was 13, but I thought she was too young. You know, I was 15. <laughs> Okay. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, she was very smart. Like you say, God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. I would go to the closest church around. We never had a, a regular church. I went to Bible school every Wednesday from school because the Lester was going to the Bible school. <laughs> I said, the Lord, he worked in mysterious. He got me in there, you know. But anyway, we... Um, uh, yeah, that's another point, though. But uh, when I did get to the 11th grade, mm -hmm. I was doing poorly. Mm -hmm. And before that, when I was about in the 10th or 9th, Mr. Tom called me down. 108 was a, a class, a grade, where they put all the retarded kids or the kids that couldn't learn. And you know what the kids thought then. Well, if you will go to 108, you're a dummy. Mm -hmm. I was called out of art class to show you how this guy is. It's Mr. Tom. And he said, Bill, you're not doing good, Billy. You're not doing good in your grades. Tomorrow, you don't report to your regular homewood. You go to your 108. Well, I'm around there, nice looking kid, chasing girls and all that. And, every, and I didn't appear to be dumb or stupid, but I was about my schoolwork, I was. Mm -hmm. I, but I didn't belong in 108. Right. See? And I went back to my art class and I couldn't hold the tears. The teacher saw it. I, I forgot her name now and I shouldn't have. She said, what's the matter with you, Billy? I said, Mr. Tom, and I started crying, was going to put me in 108. He said, he what? Like that, she said. She said, take your chair, go back. And she said, dry your eyes, you know. And uh, this was a white teacher, you know, because we had no black teachers. Tell you how, you know, everybody is good. I don't, don't think like all people, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she left the room. She told the class, continue with your drawings, and you too, Bill. And she said, I'm going out for a minute. She went out. She was gone almost a whole period, almost 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And she came back. You know what she told me? Mm -hmm. Billy, you go to your regular homeroom tomorrow. And that's just the way she said it. She went down there and raised hell and had me to go, and she said, but Bill, you have to pick up your work. She looked at, I remember doing that, you have to do your work. Mm -hmm. And I was an interesting girl, see, I wasn't interested in working, nobody, my mother wasn't, she just saw my report card. I could have signed it. Right. <laughs> as far as I go, I think a couple of times I did. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. Because they didn't put the emphasis on it at that time. No. And, uh, uh, I said, yes, ma'am. And I picked up a little bit, got out of 11th grade, and was getting ready to go into 12th grade. Well, the girls were still in my eyes. And I didn't think I needed that 12th grade, because I was, I, I knew what most of the kids were learning, you know, in school, but not the facts of it, you know. Uh, sociology and things like that, I was very compatible with people and all. And it wasn't too much they could tell me about sociology, just maybe the, uh, I, I felt. Mm -hmm. I learned a term a long, long time ago, and I've always used it, used it. 
I had what you call the disease called Weisenheimeritis. Okay. What is this called? Weisen? <laughs> Weisenheimeritis. I learned that term a long time ago. That means that you think you're wiser and you got an itis. See? <laughs> Weisenheimeritis. <laughs> but you don't, you know. I quit school. And then I met my wife at a skating rink. And when I was 17, she was, Nat was about two years older than me. Mm -hmm. And she was around, and I asked, who is that? You know, my friend Bruce. And he said, uh, oh, that's Natalie. He said, she's a good girl. She's a real good girl. She said, she said, don't try anything with her, you know. I said, no, no, I wouldn't, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we went, uh, I hope, I'm not saying anything out of bounds, am I? No. But, uh, we went, uh, I moved, skated down and I met her. And we got into a conversation. I'm skating around. I had my skates on and skating with her side by side and we were talking. You were both good skaters? She was, yeah. I was pretty good. I told you I was a jack of all trades, you know. Mm -hmm. And this Alfonso Scott started after I did and he, he turned because he kept at it. He was damn near a professional, a rollerblade. Not rollerblades, but roller skate, four wheel. And uh, anyway, she came with her boyfriend or her friend named Charles, Charles Gray. And uh, they were friends in school. And I guess they could, he never took her on dates or nothing, but they were safe friends, excuse me, after they left school. See. And uh, uh, he had bought her skating, or they had met this skating. That's what we used to do then. You used to meet, okay. meet at the show, okay. meet at that. You didn't take nobody to the show because you didn't have the money, you know. Right. I'll meet you in the show on Saturday, right. <laughs> up in the balcony, you know. Right. And we sit up there and hug and kiss. Didn't watch the movie until the good movie, the good western came on, <laughs> John Wayne, and then, and then you were all attention, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it was, and. Uh, then uh, I said, can, I'm going to walk you home tonight. She said, well, Charles brought me. I said, well, it's okay. You can walk home too, you know. So he did. But he wouldn't walk up beside us. He walked back there, behind us. I said, why is he walk, walking back there? He says, I don't know. He says he wants to watch you because he's heard about you, you know. I said, oh, that's all lies, you know, which a lot of it was, you know. And... Uh, it, uh, I was kind of a nice looking kid and I, and I had a girlfriend every time I, somebody turned around, you know. But there, it was just a girlfriend in those days, a kiss and a hug, you know what I mean? So uh, I said, well, if I was him, did he call himself liking you? Yeah. I said, I wouldn't walk back there. I said, I'd walk up here with us, you know. <laughs> And from that time on, he was out of the picture. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was out of the picture. And the rest is history. <laughs> we got married. Like I said, she was about two years older than I was. Not quite. She was born in 26. I was born in 28. But uh, she was very, very, very smart, like Melanie, my daughter and my Sue daughter here. Kids. And I told them they take after their mother. They didn't take after me, you know. Because, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we had the two kids. That, uh, the two oldest ones, Bill and Rock. Then, for uh, ten years, we didn't have any children. She had a little problems after that. And after the last one, she had a little problem. She almost died because they propped her up to keep blood going to her head. You know, I remember in the hospital. And uh, she was on a danger list at that time. And whatever the doctor did, about a year later, she became pregnant with Melanie. There was a 10-year gap. Then a year later than Melanie, she became pregnant with David. That's... David's the one I lost, you know. And then a, two years later, she became pregnant with Chris. 
So there's three right now. So all of a sudden we have three kids, I mean five kids, three new ones. The other ones were on their way, were teenagers. Then seven years later, <laughs> she became pregnant with Sue, the mother of these. <laughs> so we had three sets. And she said, you know, we were the youngest parents in a high school graduation. I said, and now we are the oldest parents at the high school graduate. <laughs> And uh, it just tickled me, you know, that, uh, that, so that's how the married life was, you know, yeah. that. And we stayed together for 52 years. Wow. She opened up a business, the data entry business, doing the, and we had a house on our home, and uh, another house, rather, a double house, and we set up a data entry business there. Her name was Natalie. I told her her mother didn't know how to spell Natalie, and she named her N-A-T-H-L-I-E, Natalie, you know. <laughs> And uh, I used to kid her. Your parents didn't know how to smell, that's all. Your name was supposed to be Natalie. <laughs> we go around like that, good naturedly, but we go around. Mm -hmm. And uh, Natalie, and it's the first time I heard the name Farrah, like Farrah Fawcett. Mm -hmm. And I often wondered sometime, you, I don't think I've ever heard that name again outside of Farrah Fawcett. Have you ever heard Farrah? Mm -hmm. And the old man, guess where he came from? Now, either his folks maybe knew them, he came from Temple, Texas, down in there, where uh, her dad, uh, uh, where Farrah Fawcett came from, down in that part of Texas. Mm -hmm. So it might have been a name that the family heard. I'm not claiming relatives or right. nothing. I'll just tell you, it's probably a name that was known in that part of the country, yeah. Farrah, yeah. you know. And I said, it's very pretty. And then Farrah Fawcett came out, which she was much younger, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, that movie star got your name, you know? Wow. Like people used to say I looked like uh, the fellow that played the Amon, the Honorable Am, Am, Ma, what's his name, Elijah Ma. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. in, uh, I do know who you're talking about. In the uh, story about uh, Red, right. uh, what's his name, uh, Malcolm X. Right. And everybody used to call me that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you look like Muhammad, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's yeah. what it was. It was a tongue twister for me, you know. And um, I and everybody would call me that guy that played him, Freeman. Mm -hmm. He come from Ohio. Mm -hmm. And everybody used to call me up when they see him on the regular movie. He used to play a little detective on the, on the one of the soap operas. Mm -hmm. uh, and was it Al Freeman? His name was. Yeah, not the not the, the frame that's the movie star now. Right, right. Not but the Morgan other Freeman, Freeman. Not, not Morgan Freeman. Right, right. No, I think it was Al Freeman. And anyway, people would call me up when they'd see him on the show. Hey, this guy looks like you, you know. I said, well, he came from Ohio, and guess what? But he came from Columbus. His dad played a violin. He said, I heard him once, where he said, my dad played a violin. Well, my dad played a violin, too. No kidding. I don't know whether it was a connection or coincidence. And your dad played the violin. Yeah, he played the violin. So I said, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, but, no, you know, it's that's just fun. maybe just coincidence. coincidence. Yeah. Well, so that's the lineage for that musical talent that I'm hearing, huh? Yeah, I guess so, on both sides. Okay. Fanny, you didn't live in Fanny McDonald's house and not play an instrument. Oh. No, you had to play an instrument. You had to learn, so every one of her kids could play an instrument. But my mother was a piano player, because my mom said she was tone deaf. She couldn't play by ear. She only could play by notes. Okay. See. And your niece, Bunny? Yeah, all of them. There's music. That's why I said you had, we had a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of one that ever perfected. That's it when you have too many talents, because yeah. you're too busy doing different things. Yeah. You know? So tell me about some of the jobs. So let's talk about your interaction with Cleveland. You're not running overtime here, are you? Yeah. Because I get sidetracked, see? You're doing good. All right. My jobs. After I got married, Nat was, became pregnant with Robin. And uh, we lived in a house that my mother had up over the third floor. The first job I got was a little place on Center Avenue in Pittsburgh. The guy made olive oil. 
or didn't make it, but he bottled it. Mm -hmm. And I had a job there, making a few bucks a week. Okay. You know. But I used to take home a jug of olive oil, and I told by my mother to keep a woman from having stretch marks. She says, you take that olive oil, and you rub her stomach with it every night before you, after you get ready to go to bed. And I rubbed that olive oil on there. My wife had six children, never had a stretch mark on her stomach. Really? That's what she said. She said, if you do that, she won't have a stretch mark. Wow. See, like she always believed in putting on a belly band. You know, people today said, she said, look, that it caused gas. She said, I don't care whether you put the belly band on or not. A baby's always going to have gas. That's what she used to say. You know? mm -hmm. And she's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. And they used to say, but you never saw, a, it was very rare to see a protruding navel, navel, rather, in those days, because that navel was, st you can't see mine now, so do you see a little circle there. But, very, but now you see navels sticking out and things like that. A baby cry, a baby breathes from his stomach. She told me that. He doesn't, a baby don't breathe from his chest. She said, you watch a baby, he breathes from his stomach, you know, and... Uh, you know, those old people, they had to keep you alive, and they took care, they did the best they could, you know? Right. And, uh, but anyway, we got sidetracked again. You oh. were telling me my jobs. Yeah. Okay. So that was the first job I had. And then I wasn't making enough money, so I got a job at the uh, Volkwein Music Store down on Liberty Avenue, working in the sock room, and making a few bucks, 20-some dollars a a week and I would make five dollars extra a night if I ran the elevator on the night that they taught music to people up on the fourth floor and I did that every Thursday I think it was Thursday we would I'd run the elevator and I got about thirty dollars a week in those days and because uh, you could buy a house oh very cheap compared to houses now in the 40s. That would have been about, uh, we got married in 45. That was about from anywhere from the last part of 45, 46, 47, 48. Mm -hmm. I stayed there. In 48, I left the stock room there. The old fella worked with the old timers way back. He had the whole stock room. Black man named John Asheville. Quite a gentleman. And I learned music, because everybody there was almost musical. And then there was a guy down there that used to have a band back in the 20s and all the named Johnny Hawkins. And Johnny was my buddy, because Johnny could, was like my family. He could do anything. He could play a trumpet. He could play a, a, the piano. And at all the parties we gave at Volkwein Music Store, everybody, everybody was a musician there, but everybody gathered around Johnny because Johnny knew the old songs. The first time I ever heard about U.B. Blake, mm -hmm. the black uh, entertainer, John told me about it and told me the song, Memories of You. And he used to sit and play it. Breaking tides at sunrise, every sunset too. I can't reach it now. Everything seems to bring Memories of you. you. You ever heard of that song? Yeah. It's a good one. That was U.B. Blake's song. First time I heard about U.B. Blake. Wow. And I don't want to get sidetracked on U.B. Blake because he was another story. <laughs> but you got to read about U.B. Okay. He was something else. And Alberta Hunter, the singer that used to sing with him. And look, listen to her like, look her up. Don't look that name up. Look those two up. Okay. Alberta Hunter and U.B. Blank. Her life was fantastic. She just died here a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And she moved from the south up to uh, Chicago. I won't go into it because the characters I knew, I loved characters. Yeah. Always did. Yeah. If a guy was a character, if an old timer was a character, he was my meat. I stayed on him. You know? <laughs> sort of like you now. You're interviewing me now. Yeah. I, guess, I guess you'd call me a character, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and because um, I did some, you know, you dumb some things, and I thought, things. Uh, I, I call them, 
I look back kind of crazy, I said, you know. But anyway, uh, I wasn't making enough money at Volkwines, and they opened up the Owl Cab Company. And Nat and I had moved into the project uh, up on Chauncey Drive, up on Bedford Avenue in Pittsburgh. And I went down, and I put my age up. I was only about... 20 at that time, or 19, I'm not sure, 19 or 20, and uh, they did, never checked, you know, they didn't check, because it was a black cub, cab company, and I guess I was presentable, and the one lady knew me that worked in the office, an older lady, and I guess she told them I was a family man, needed a job, and was a nice guy, and they might have checked, I don't know, but just let it slide, mm -hmm. you know? Because you were supposed to be 21 before you drove a cab. Okay. Yeah. So I went to cab school to learn to drive, and that's how I really learned to drive an automobile in the cab. Did you have your license? Oh, I had my license. Okay. Yeah. Because I went, had to get a job at Volkwines, and I got the job driving the truck there. Okay. And a man, a uh, jitney okay. driver, I paid him to teach me how to drive okay. on a standard, uh, standard shift. And... Uh, and that's how I got my job, at, like I said, at Volkwines, because I could drive to it. I made all their deliveries from Volkwines. I just didn't stay in. And I, that's how I said I really learned to drive good at Volkwines, at Volkwines' expense, <laughs> you know. And then I would got a job driving a cab. And that just polished me up on my driving, the cab driver. Okay. Because I used to fly around those hills, and I look at them now, oh, in the wintertime, and ice and fog and everything else, you know. Yeah. Nothing stopped you. Yeah. You went. And uh, anyway, the, uh, from the cab drivers, I uh, stayed there for, well, I don't remember how many years. Well, yes, I did too. Because I moved to Cleveland, where my brother was and said, you got to come to Cleveland because you can get a good job up here. And that was in 1960. I came to Cleveland. Which brother was this? Uh, Brady. Okay. Yeah. He was working and making what we call big money. He was working at, well, he was working at a parking garage, but I put him on the big money after I came here. We went to Chevrolet plant. I got a job at Chevrolet plant, and he got a job, and that's where he retired. Oh. I left after a year. I guess I had a lot of my grandpa my folks in me, my parents, mm -hmm. you know, because I went to the window one day in the summertime at a machine shop, and I was learning all the machinery around and running big machines and things like that. Didn't go there as a porter or nothing. Just went there running a machine, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no women there at the time. And about a year later, they bought ladies, and they started working on machineries and things like that. Mm -hmm. It became co-ed. I went to the window one day, and I smelled the new grass they were cutting. That was my last day. I walked out and told Nat, <laughs> I said, I quit my job. She says, you what? I said, I quit my job. Didn't have another job. <laughs> I said, she said, why did you quit, quit your job? I said, I smelled them mowing the grass, and it reminded me of mowing hay. And I said, it was like medicine. I said, I'll never go back to a factory again in my life. You know, oil smell and all that. So she put up with me. I said, she was a good woman. <laughs> you know? So uh, I went driving the bus. Got a job driving the bus. And I stayed there between uh, up until 1957. The guy I was on the bus, an old fella named, a uh, kid named, um, here in Cleveland, Holloway. Holloway came by. I'm going down to join the police department. You, would you want to go down? Sounds interesting. You know, good job. I know my uncle was a policeman, and I know how he was in Pittsburgh. It looked like he lived a life, you know, and I loved guns and loved shooting because I could shoot from the country on, you know, and we used to shoot in Pittsburgh there to the side of the hill. There was a house up on top of the hill. Nobody ever called the cops.
because we always shot right into the hill, but never put a bullet up on that house, and he never complained. I taught Nat's sister how to shoot from that hill. You know, I had a 22 rifle, and uh, I hunted a lot, a little small game hunting around Pittsburgh there, and that's where it sounded good. You walk a beat, you carry a gun out in the public, and it sounded good to me, you know? I went down, I passed the test. I passed the uh, test where they interviewed you in Cleveland and all that. And for some reason, Holiday didn't make it. For what? He didn't make it. Oh, really? No. Uh, I think they saw something in him when he got, took the psychological test. He was a very nervous person. He smoked one cigarette right after another. He be, and he talked. He wasn't very calm. He was very nervous when he talked. You know, sort of. Good guy. Smart man. But I knew it had to be something along that line. The reason he, I never asked him. But right after then, he got a job at the post office. Delivering mail. His dad was a postman, you know. And we were good friends from all then on. But I got the job as a policeman. He got the job there. Stayed at the policeman until uh, uh, 70, from 70, 20 years, just about 20 years. Really? Yeah. So in those days, though, they didn't have an education requirement? You had to uh, be able to pass the test. That's all I ever knew. Yeah. I put down there that I went to high school. Okay. And they said, finish high school, I put yes. You okay. know? And uh, now remember, that was, when I tell you that was? That was, uh, we came there in 60. Or, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't 60. I correct. That was in 50. Yeah. We came to, uh, so you got, I got my figures all wrong. It's been a long time. <laughs> we came to Cleveland in 1950. Okay. And in 57, 50, is where I worked in the factory, all the way up to, uh, he said, let's go join the police department, mm -hmm. uh, which was 57. Okay. That's right. I joined the police department in 57. So did you have a 57 Chevy? No, but I wish I had a had one, because they're <laughs> worth money now, a 57 Chevy. But it probably would have been destroyed, you know, or broken down. Because Bo took care of his cars, like that Thunderbird. That's why I'm driving it today. But uh, anyway, I went down and stayed there to 77. Well, can we hear a little bit, if you're a policeman, yeah. and you have a good uh, feel of what the city was like at that time. Oh, yeah. The city was real nice. There was businesses everywhere. Black and white businesses. Your uh, people lived about where they wanted to live. There was no restrictions. There might have been some up in the Heights and all that. I remember the fella, one fella, black fella, when he lived up there off of Lee Road to the east toward Wardensville Heights, he had to go around and get permission from all the people on the street that he moved on. Would they mind him moving in there? I told him. I said, I wouldn't have asked them a damn thing. I said, they either want my money or they don't. I, and my neighbors, I said, I would have never done it. But old, uh, he was kind of easy like that. He was a southern kid from South Carolina, and he was maybe kind of used. I wouldn't say he wasn't a man, though. He was a man, you know what I mean. But he didn't never want to make waves, you know what I mean. But a good guy. Thomas Bruton, yeah, a good man. Him and his wife, Katie. But I said, I wouldn't ask him the damn thing. You know, you want my money, you're going to get it. So you, you know. have more of a rebel spirit? I guess I did. I obeyed my bosses. But he better not start any foolishness. Like, I had a couple of sergeants I fell out with on my job. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're getting... Okay, I had a couple of sergeants I fell out because of that. Uh, 
I had a big argument with a sergeant one time. He put me up on charges, but they didn't charge me. Really? Yeah, because uh, he told me I wasn't supposed to think. No kidding. I said, I'm not supposed to. What? I came in and changed a horse. My horse dropped his shoe. And we were just starting. I didn't ride. I came in. He wasn't there. So there was a horse that I always used to ride for the guy, and he wouldn't mind. I took that horse out to finish the third. So he was about two hours into the thing. When I came back in, he was new as a sergeant. He told me, who told you to take that horse out? I said, nobody. I said, it was so-and-so's horse, and I ride it quite a bit when he doesn't work, and he wouldn't have mind. He'd have loved it because he was off and his horse got exercise. He says, well, who told you to, to do that? I said, no one. He says, well, I said, I just used my brain and thought that it would be the thing to do rather than sit here and wait on you to come back in. <laughs> you know? He said, well, who told you you were supposed to think? I looked I said, who told me what? He said, who told you you were supposed to think on your own? I said, you mean to say that you give me a 38 pistol, tell me to go out in the street and make a decision that doesn't have to be made by any man, whether I'm to take a man's life in a fraction of a second or to leave him alone? And I told him, hot, you know. I said, whether I'm to make that decision in a split section, second and kill a man? And you tell me I'm not supposed to think about taking a horse out that I have rode before? I told him, I said, you're full of the word. <laughs> and I turned, so he wrote me up for saying that I told him he was that. Because he did tell me to repeat it. And I know he wanted to get a witness, you know. I said, I'll repeat it the next time I see you or something like that. I said, I don't know. I said over the phone. But anyway, uh, he put me up on charges with my lieutenant. I went and asked the lieutenant one day. I said, uh, Lou, can I get off? I want to go to Pittsburgh. Can I get off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? And I'll probably be back Monday, I'm not sure. He said, four days? or He said, Bill, he said, I understand you and the sergeant had a few words. I said, yeah. And uh, I said, but I understand that you cursed at him and told him, uh, swore at him. I said, swore at him? I don't know where it came from, from here. It just popped in. I said, no. I said, I wouldn't swear to the sergeant. He said, you didn't tell the sergeant a curse word or about his ex movement or something he said and use a curse word toward him? I said, no. He said, you didn't tell the sergeant he was full of, and then he stopped. I said, no. He, he, remember, he asked me to repeat what I said. He must have misunderstood me because I told him that he was picking at nits. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where that came from, <laughs> but it just bounced right out. You know, that's what you told him. I said, yeah. And uh, and when he told me, I wasn't supposed to think on my own and things like that. And I just took a horse out. I told him you're picking at nits. You know, like that. And he said, <laughs> and that's what you said. I said, yeah. And I don't think he liked the sergeant because he was new. And I said, because I saw a faint, he almost laughed, but he didn't dare laugh, you know. I saw a little faint smile. I caught it, you know. And he said, how many days you want off? I said, four. Okay, you got him. Because if you did say, curse at him, I think you should be uh, shot down about it, you know. That's what he said, you know. He didn't mean shot down physically, right, right. but he mean, you know. <laughs> I said, no, I wouldn't say nothing like that, but the hell I wouldn't, because he was sickening as a sergeant. He went and bought a book when he became sergeant on how to issue orders to men. Well, how many, you know, you missed a part here for us. So when I think of somebody joining the police force, I think of them riding around in a black and white car, and you're talking about horses. So fill in that part and tell me. Well, I was in, a, I went in basic patrol, walked to patrol. Okay. As a rookie, I was on about two months when 
a guy over on Euclid Avenue, they put out a night crew, uh, worked from, uh, what was it, four in the, four, no, six at night to around two in the morning or later. It was supposed to be an eight-hour shift. It was to curb the late-night problems, you know, and it was an unusual shift. And this guy was hitting the head with a brick. He was a policeman, new, came on with me with a red brick down in front of the restaurant and it had to be taken off the job. Okay, so they picked me to go over on the street. And I was around Cedar and all that, Cedar, Euclid, that area over there. And all the streets in between. Well, the first night that I walked Cedar, I was pretty young looking, you know, and I weighed about 140. 50 pounds, if I weighed that much. And uh, I walked the beat the first time, and I was smiling, like I always smile, talking to everybody like I always talk. <laughs> and we get down to this one saloon at 79th and uh, 79th and Cedar. And uh, there were guys, some were leaning against the car. It was like walking a gauntlet. Some were leaning up against a building. So I'm walking down, this new, fresh policeman that looked like a young kid. And this guy said, one guy up against the car, just as I got between the, the two of them, said, this is a young policeman out here tonight. Kid, I'll slap his face before 12 o'clock. And all of them laughed. And I just got by him as he said it. And uh, I said, well, now or never. And I turned. I just wheeled on him, you know, like that, real quick. And I walked back to him. And I stood. And I looked at him and I said, you don't have to wait to 12 if you want to slap it. And I just looked at him. And he, <laughs> oh man, I was only kidding. And the, the guys around there started laughing at him, you know, and was laughing. I said, oh, okay. And I walked on, you know. But from that time on, I never had any trouble on Cedar Avenue about a guy challenging me. Wow. You know, never from that time on. I've had it from ladies. <laughs> ladies? One lady went after my badge and she almost tore it off. What? Yeah, because I made a mistake. She was raising hell. And she was just raising hell on the street. I said, ah, I said, no, just go on. Because she was after a guy. I grabbed her by her wrist and I just, or her hand rather, and I just kind of bent her. I said, you know, I talked soft to her. I said, don't, don't act like that. I said, you don't, it's not ladylike, you know. And I said, you want to fight? And I kind of sweet talked her a little bit, you know. And she calmed down. I let her go. And I said, oh, you know, go ahead on up the street. Let it, you'll cool off. And she started to walk. I made a mistake. See, you make mistakes when you're not you. I said, and don't bring that stuff down this side anymore. She said, what? <laughs> she turned around on me and she lit on on me. I had to grab that woman. She had my badge. It was halfway torn off. I never, you know, hit her or nothing. Like, I've seen some policemen hit. I never would hit a woman in the street, you know, like that. And, I, and when I said in the street, it sounded like I said I'd hit him in private. But no, I wouldn't do it then either. I never could hit a woman, you know. And I just, uh, uh, I held her. I grabbed her by both arms. And I mean, I put it on her. I grabbed her wrist that time. And I put it on her to hurt her, to stop her. You know, and I stopped her. But since I did all that, I had to call the wagon and put her in jail. Because, see, I grabbed her. And when you grab somebody physically, I've let men go after I've grabbed it. But I've never let uh, anybody go that I thought that might want to come back on you. You know, they can come back and sue you. He broke my arm or, or he did this or he did that. So you better arrest him. Because right. you're in jeopardy then, see. Right. So I had to call the wagon and wound up putting that lady in jail 
and I had, and so I got the reputation that he is nice. He will smile. And he'll still be laughing at you or smiling, nice, when he calls the wagon. <laughs> and I don't mean to brag about my, I was not a bad man. Mm -hmm. I wasn't known to be a fighter or a bad man. You know what I mean? But I would get the wagon there some way if I had to, wow. you know. So let me ask you a couple of things. How many blacks were on the police force when you joined? There was no motorcycle policemen. No motor. Uh, Nicky Hauser was a horseman. Nick wanted to get into the mounted unit. They didn't take Nick into the mounted unit because Nick was a lot like I was. Nick Hauser, he didn't fool around. He's a serious man, a nice guy. But you didn't joke or mess Nick with Nick. He was, huh? Nick is a black man. Yeah, he had a Hauser German name. They probably had German in them because they looked like Germans, mm -hmm. just brown as skin. Mm -hmm. They were browner. Nick was a little darker than I was, mm -hmm. you know. And I got a tan right there, see. And also, but a nice man, good-looking man, handsome man, you know, but he didn't fool. Where I was more friendlier with the public, quicker to smile than Nick. <laughs> than Nick was, because <laughs> uh, we were just two different individuals, but he was a good policeman. Was it just the two of you that were black on the Oh, no, course? no, there no, was there was a lot of black. Joe Jasper, uh, uh, I think you interviewed, uh, no, no, he wasn't, uh, who was the guy? A uh, big man, he used to be a special policeman up at uh, Richmond Mall. Ah, the name will come to me, a lot of them I haven't used for years. No, uh, Jackson Boys? Uh, I, my partner, uh, one with the Jackson was the oldest one. They were big men. So the police force there was a lot of black. When you oh started. yeah. Okay. Uh, the, one of the ones that was way back, he was still on too, was the old timer. And you know I can't. I'll call his name if I think about it. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, I'm 80, up there in the 80s, and uh, uh, there was a. I got on in uh, like I told her, in uh, 57. Yeah, but. This guy, a Pop, almost had it. Pop, we, everybody called him Pop something. He worked down around Quincy, 55th Street, all in through there. Mm -hmm. And later on, he became a detective himself, okay. you know. And uh, Pop, there was a couple of them. And then one became the head policeman in Cleveland Clinic. And I can't even think of his name if I sat down, you know. Yeah. And, oh, there was a lot of black men. Okay. But they weren't. All in special units. That was special. So now how did you get to the special unit? Well, what was the first one? What the first course? one was the uh, motorcycle unit. Oh, you went to there? Yeah. Me and a fella, they put in a request for motorcycle policemen, and then they were beginning to integrate. And uh, Clay Huff, Clarence Huff, and myself were the first to be picked on the motorcycle unit. And guys want to say, yeah, they probably picked you. Because, like I said, I have a tan now, but we were a little lighter, and Huff was lighter than I was. Mm -hmm. Might have been the truth. I don't know. But they picked Huff, and they picked me. And we went into training by old uh, Sergeant Tunney, old German guy. And he very stately. And you think he was real stiff and stiff, but he was one of the nicest, fairest men I've ever known. He didn't pick favorites. You know, and he taught us on the motorcycle. His son be was there too on a bike unit at the time, named after uh, Bob Tunney was his name. He was once the mayor of one of these little towns down here around Brexhill. Mm -hmm. He became a mayor down there. Also a fine young man, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think Bob is dead now too, but Tunney was 70 some years old and he was still a sergeant. I think they had to retire at 72. And he didn't last long after they made him retire. So you went to the special unit, the special unit? The motorcycle unit. unit. So we how, passed that. How, how was, uh, where, where, where was your beat? Is that what they call them? Uh, we worked together, Huff and I did, mm -hmm. as partners for years. And our beat, well, they would assign us our car was number 60. 
That was our traffic car, those green and brown and gray cars just had police up on the front fender. And that was a running machine at, at uh, Plymouth. But you couldn't stop them because they warped, they made the brakes with uh, aluminum alloy. And when they got hot, after you hit them once or twice, you'd have pedal, but you didn't have a lot of brake. <laughs> <laughs> that thing with pedal would be down, and that thing would still be going. <laughs> this is motorcycle? No, this was on the uh, cars. Because when you couldn't ride the motorcycle but for the weather, you rode the green pastel cars. Oh. They're brown, gray. The old timers, I don't know if they still have them, but they remember them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that deer fly trying to hit you up on the forehead there. Yeah. And they try to come back, so, yeah, they're, they're nasty too. But I'll watch and see that they don't. But anyway, uh, old uh, Huff and I, we worked together for till he went to Europe. He worked there about, oh, uh, Huff must have worked, he got transferred and then he went to Europe. He, Huff got transferred because Clay was a player. And white, black, blue or green. They could be as black as your sweater or as white as snow. He played, and he didn't hide it. And I'm not telling anything that people don't already know. Mm -hmm. And that was one reason that he got transferred out, and there was probably some other reasons. But uh, that, was, that was about it. So was it... Okay. And then he went to Europe. Was A that... woman took him to Europe. Really? So that was the end of his playing days. She took him out of commission, huh? Well, no because he wanted to stay in Europe. She wanted to go back, and she wouldn't give him his fare back. Uh, <laughs> he stayed over there for 11 years between France, Sweden, Italy, and he wound up in Greek before he came back, Greece. And he said he liked Greece better than he did any of them. And now we're sort of still together because he met a girl here that belonged to a club called the, uh, it's a black club. She looked white, but she had gone with a black guy for long years. But she looked like she was white, but I thought she was just a light-skinned black person because when you look at her, you say, yeah, no, she's not all white, but she looked white. And the first time he came here with her, I was working part-time. I quit at the gas station up there. I'd go up there every weekend and work for the guy. And um, she stuck her head around the door like that and she came in and she said, Billy, how are you doing? And I'm looking at her and Billy, uh, my mind's working then, you know. <laughs> Where, you know. And uh, I said, uh, okay. And then I thought she looked like a girl that worked with the Chevrolet, but years had passed and maybe she had changed. And then he stuck his ugly head around the corner and started grinning. <laughs> he had sent her in there first, you know. <laughs> Had me going for a while. I was trying to think, you know, where do I know her from? And, uh, and I wasn't that old that I was that forgetful then, see. <laughs> but anyway, um, he met a girl here. What do they call that club? Lewindi? No, not the Lewindi Club. That was Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a black club. It's popular here. People would know it here. And they used to go up to Erie all the time. And she was in the club because she had a black husband or a black boyfriend. I'm not sure what it was. But she met Clay, and Clay and her used to go up to Erie all the time. And uh, now he moved to Chicago. Now Clay didn't have a window nor a pot. Well, let me bring you back. Yeah. So that's Clay's life. Okay, bring me back to my life. <laughs> okay. Well, I was saying how how me and Clay stayed together. Yeah. Okay. That's your good friend. Yeah, but he's in Florida now, in the same city I am. What? Yeah, but he's had strokes. He's in a home. Oh. And uh, I go to see him every night. He's about 15 minutes away from me. No kidding. But the girl that he met, she was a professor. She moved to Florida, to Orlando. And then she moved up to, to make it short so it's not 
of what I'm talking about. She moved into where her sister was, up where I'm at, mm -hmm. and she moved him because she had had him in a home, and he couldn't take care of himself no more, and she was too small to take care of him. Mm -hmm. And I went, you, I still go to see him in his home, mm -hmm. but he hardly recognizes me now. Yeah. And I said, isn't it funny we wound up here together after working so long together? Yeah, you know, I said, I bet you guys up north think that we were a couple of old faggots went down here and wanted to stay down here. <laughs> but he, uh, and then getting back to me now. We we'll yeah. go back to me. Okay. So let's, let's, let me, I'm going to pop around a little bit. Yeah. Because you were in the uh, motorcycle unit. Yeah. And that was good. Tell me just a little bit about the politics of the city when you were on the motorcycle. Politics. Who was mayor then? Uh, Celebrese. Mayor Celebrese. Uh -huh. Celebrese kind of turned the city around a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right after him was uh, Mayor, was it Loker? I think. Uh -huh. Yeah, Celebrese. And uh, Celebrese opened up. My brother, everybody thought I got on because my brother was an attorney. He was with the pr prosecutor's office. Right. Yeah, and uh, no, because when he knew it, I was on the force. I guess somebody might have turned around, but I was already appointed to the force. Right. When he knew I was going on the police department, he said, well, you weren't going on anything, or, you know, the police department. I said, well, that's good money, good job, and I like it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I guess everybody thought that politics entered there, but it, it didn't, you know. It so, might... So you, were you still, you were patrolling the Cedar area? My beat was mm -hmm. St. Clair, mm -hmm. from 55th Street to out to, uh, oh, out past Nottingham okay. on St. Clair, and all in between. Okay. And I stopped at 55th Street. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that was the end of my beat. Right. And, uh, Interesting times in Cleveland at that time? Very interesting. What's the most pronounced thing that you remember about that time? Well, later on that time is when uh, Muhammad uh, Evans and the gangs started, the black gangs started. Not the black nationalists now, but the black, uh, what do they call themselves? Black something, but it wasn't the nationalists, the black nationalists. It was an organized, and they mostly had gang guys. They, they were what? gang, mm -hmm. gangs. Mm -hmm. And that's where they got in the shootout with the black, uh, in the... I almost had the name. But anyway, that's where they got in the shootout. Mm -hmm. Over on Huff Avenue was the first one they had. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was start, that started because of a black gang? Well, the, there was a black racial gang, tendency. racial, racial, the black gang was in there because the blacks were moving in. The Chinese and the hillbillies used to be strong in there. They moved out. Mm -hmm. And they said this guy put, it was all black. There used to be a drugstore across the street. Old uh, Delgado owned it. A little drugstore at 79th. And they said a man put, that owned a bar, a white man owned it, put a sign in the window, no blacks like they are. And I said that had to be the biggest lie ever told. Because that man wouldn't have been that stupid to put, it was all black, yeah. a sign like that in the window. Yeah. See? And I said it was just started for some reason. He might have thrown a black guy out there that was giving a lot of trouble and put him out. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, yeah, they're putting a, they're that, they're, they'll put a sign in the window. And Muhammad started that over there. I understood he started. I'm not sure. But I understood that he started the shooting over there, Evans. And they started shooting. I was off that day, luckily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the cops had a shot. We had a. And this is in Huff. This is it was right in Huff, right at the 79th and Huff is where it started from. Wow. And uh, after that, started over in Sowensky. And that was a big one. That went all over. The East, Sowinski. Down there, uh, mm -hmm. Superior there, mm -hmm. uh, near 79th Street. Mm -hmm. And White still lived down there, Whites and all. And that one, I was in that one from the beginning. That's when they bought in the National Guard and all that. 
you know. And I used to argue with guys, and I'd tell them, they're talking, it's going to be a revolution, going to be a re I said, wait a minute. I said, think. I said, all they have to do, if you start a revolution, you can't win. And he said, what do you mean we can't win? You can't win. I said, they'll ring from 55th Street down the Lakeshore Boulevard out to uh, Nottingham with tanks over to past Cedar Avenue and won't allow you out. They'll make it a ghetto, right. You won't be allowed because you call this a ghetto. This is not a real ghetto. I said a real ghetto is like they had in Europe with the Jews. That when you weren't allowed out at a certain time, the neighborhood, and you had to be back in at a certain time. And you better be back in or you could be shot. You could leave your ghetto anytime you got ready, but they call it a ghetto. And it is in a sort, but it's not a true ghetto, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because you got freedom to leave. Right. No, in Europe, you didn't have, the Jews didn't have freedom to leave. So you tell them that... They... Oh, I said, all they have to do is ring it, and you know what they would do then? They, would, they wouldn't have to fire a shot. They'd cut off your water. It's controlled outside of 55th Street. They'd cut off your gas, your electricity. You couldn't even flush your toilets, I used to tell them, you know. And I said, and then after you stored your ammunition and you shot, does anybody here know how to make a bullet? To reload? No. You can't even reload your shells if you saved them. So how the hell are you going to win a revolution? And I told him about Willie B. Hartsford of Atlanta, Georgia. Good man. Willie B. Hartsford said, our trouble is with country people coming into Atlanta bringing their country ways. I heard him on TV one time. He said they, they used to call him, nicknamed him Rastus because he favored integration, you know. He said you cannot bring, it has to come. I said you can't, the black people cannot make all white people their enemies. They have to take the good white people, the good black people and make it. Because if they try to make an enemy of all the white people, they can't win. Right. And they cannot win. Right. You know? So the gangs didn't want to hear that. Because, no. Because by this time now, they're thinking black power. Yeah, and people, and the young ones coming along, they're like television. They believe almost anything you tell them on television, see? Like the three girls that stabbed a girl the other day and bought to join a, a try to kill her to join a fictitious, some type of guy that didn't even exist. And uh, what I was saying is that, and then uh, you lose. Yeah. And, and, and Hartsford, all he said was that this guy asked him, he said, well, this, the black kids down in Atlanta wrote a full column, full two-page column of their Bill of Rights, you know. And this guy said, do you think that these black killed children wrote this? that it wasn't communistic inspired. And he looked at him for about <laughs> almost a minute. He says, you know, he says, we got three black colleges here in Atlanta, Georgia. He said, and I'd hate to think that they weren't teaching those children something. And that's all he said. He never said yes or no, you know. He made the guy look like a fool. And and he was a good man. I thought Willie B. Harson was a hell of a, and they should have, you know, they call him racist and all that. But anyway, we were good back to our subject now. I have a habit of trade, you know. But so, so that was, so that was a really, really definitive time in the history of Cleveland. Oh, sure. There was a time blacks couldn't go in the Forum Cafe on Ninth Street. Right. You know, even Cleveland was wide open too. When I saw a streetcar conductor here, a black one, I didn't want to believe it. Mm. And that's when they had coal stoves in the streetcars. Wow. You didn't know about that, did you? No. You never saw one? No. <laughs> did you ever see one? A black streetcar? No, a coal stove in the streetcar. No. I came here the first time as a kid. They had streetcars running old ones and had scuttles for the coal in the heat. Mm -hmm. You ask anybody. Mm. And I mean, some of them ran on Euclid Avenue. Took those streetcars out and... Oh, yeah, and made it all... Uh, Advancements. Well, the uh, trackless trolley. Right, right. Yeah. 
And then uh, it was, a, but it was an open town. You could, that's probably why uh, the guy we were talking about, uh, the inventor, mm -hmm. they stayed in Cleveland because Cleveland was ahead of all your cities. Now you might have, you had Pittsburgh in a way of socializing with people was ahead of Cleveland, socializing. But Cleveland was way in advance. It's a shame to see how low it went. You know. Let me ask you this. Now, when you left the motorcycle unit, you asked to go to the special unit where the horses were? Oh, did I ask to go there? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I uh, left to go. Wait a minute, how did that come about? Oh, when I was in the motorcycle unit, a detective, Elmer Joseph, he got killed over a neighborhood argument about a dog or something like that. And uh, Elmer, a good detective, he asked me one time when I was on the bike, do you want to come to the uh, detective bureau? And I didn't much care for the detective bureau because there was a lot of investigation. He was in on stuff. I was living the life where I was. But I had had about 80 years, I guess, on the motorcycle. And Huff was gone. And uh, I was getting a little tired, near misses, getting hit almost on the motorcycle. And I said, one of these days I'm going to get clobbered or something, you know. And if you stay long enough, somebody will get you, you know. And I had that in my mind. That sounds interesting. Okay. And all he said, I'll keep you in mind. And one day, I uh, heard, I was trying to think just how this came about. Oh, well, one day, I think they, uh transfer came through for me. And I transfer. I'm trying to see whether I was in the mounted unit then or was I in still in the motorcycle unit. That's why I'm trying to think about it. And uh, anyway, a transfer came through, and I'm transferred into the detective viewer. Well, I just bought a harness horse, and I wanted to spend more time training my harness horse, and I didn't want to go into the detective viewer, but I, I went. And I did not care for that too much because they spend a lot of their time in court. And you think it's like TV, where he's out investigating right then, and, he usually have information brought to him, and he goes and interviews or see that people or follows it up. But there's few much, at least it was when I came along, there was few things like the detective solving the crime. No, he solves what people bring to him, you know, and he gets tips and things like that. And you still keep your informants and all that. And like I've been gone since 77. All that might have changed. I don't know. See, but you spent most of your time in court. And I sure didn't like that. And computers started coming in. And I sure didn't like computers. <laughs> yeah. And I had to learn computers, you know. And uh, I wanted out of there in the worst way. And I had to sit one sometime and answer the phone. And I became mistrustful. Of, I get paranoid about my children because I had to answer the phone and every night there was a rape. Somebody was raped. You know, black people used to didn't rape. If it was known in the house, it was kept quiet. But uh, from the, it started in the 60s. Black people, my mother and them used to walk down into the red light district at 12 o'clock at night. Let's see who's, what's going on downtown. By their self and walk the dark way home. And nobody bothered them. Right. Two women. And that long passed. But now they were raping people in abandoned cars with their kids. A little woman had her car, a uh, kid going to work, taking her to the nursery. Rape them with the kid in the car and stuff like that. All kind of sickening stuff. And that got me paranoid. Laying underneath a car when a woman walks out to the, from the uh, shopping center or somewhere and grabbing her by her feet. You know, 
and a taxi. Come out from underneath the car, and they're athlete, athletic. They can do that too. Grab you and hold you, and come out from underneath that car at the same time. You know, because more likely she's pulling back, and they go with her. You know, come out and things like that. Things you never heard of. The way they're raping, like this guy that raped these women or took them home and buried them in their walls. Now we didn't have anything like that that I know of. I never answered anything like that, but I'd have answered it where they have done it with their children watching and looking, you know, and they're begging, don't, don't bother my child, things like that. Hmm. And then I had a funny one, one I had to leave the room because <laughs> this guy, he was up on Prospect. It was bad with prostitutes then. And uh, he got what he thought was a prostitute. <laughs> it turned out he was not a prostitute. <laughs> he was dressed like a <laughs> And he, he had hold of him. And when he made the report, I wouldn't have made the report. He <laughs> I'd have kept that. It would have been my secret and nobody else. You know, <laughs> if that would have happened to me. But that's what he got for down there looking for a prostitute. You know, that's what we all thought. But anyway, <laughs> when he tried to break away from me, her, that was important. He couldn't break away. A strong man had him. You know? <laughs> Robbed him of everything he had. <laughs> Almost took his pants. He thought he was really going to get serious in, you know, oh and right, and left. And when he turned him loose, how we found him, he was in the street. And he ran up to us over on Euclid Avenue, and a guy just robbed me down there. He did? Yeah. Uh, he, where's your car? We, we knew he didn't belong there. It's down the street there. And he took us back to his car. Both doors open. Still standing over. <laughs> and we knew what the story was there. You know what I mean? But uh, he wasn't robbed. Nobody robbed him down there. He was just took his money, you know? <laughs> but anyway, those kind of things make you laugh. So what made you go to the Mount of Police now? Uh, being from the country and like my dad was a horseman. Okay. In this small town where I was born. Mm -hmm. They used to bring workhorses in there for the farmers, okay. and they would be at the sale, a man named Scott Amos. And my dad and another man, a black man named uh, Art Cunningham, used to sort of gentle those, because those horses were bad, uh, tough. They were what they called chalkers. That's what they called them. They weren't big workhorses, but some of them were big and strong, and the farmers would come in and bid on them and make them and take make put them in a harness and make uh, plow. plow horses out of them you know and they became good work horses you know if the man knew what he was doing well my dad and this art cunningham used to have kind of gentle them down and they rode them you know and uh the only thing that old art rode a mule once and he said it was named bessie he said i never could ride bessie it was like the cowboys used to do it. They kind of gentle them, get them to walk around. He said, because old Bessie, and he talked kind of funny, she'd go up in the air, you would go up in the air, and she'd come back down from the air, but you were not there. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to laugh, because that was his famous statement, you know. <laughs> but they used to gentle them. And that's how I got my love, because my dad always wanted a horse farm, where he would breed Arabian horses. And that's the type of horse that I used to train. You know, you follow wow. sort of what you, wow. your parents do. And I used to train Arabian horses because people used to say they were crazy. And Arabian horses weren't crazy and wild. You just couldn't slap a horse, Arabian horse around because he lived with people for thousands of years with the Arabs, you know. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't like the regular horses where you could take him, strap him. You had to have a little discipline with him, but you better not hit him. Mm -hmm. If you did, you didn't teach him a damn thing. Who is that? Oh, that's Kenny. Oh, Kenny's all right. He'll sit down. He won't say anything. We'll just read him and then we'll come back. Okay. And I guess you follow what your parents loved, and I grew to love what my parents loved, and I always wanted horses and a farm. And when I moved here, that's when I got my first horse. And that was in uh, 1970. 
when I went to, you might as well say, college, a guy up the street named George Brown, he was a trainer, worked for Bass Stables. I picked his brain and stayed in his stable, you know, and he taught me a lot. There was a guy named uh, Stanley, Stanley uh, Edwards, and uh, I watched all the winners and the guys that were good at training. I even telephoned him and talked to him. The guy that used to train Wayne Newton's horses, he lived in Ohio. And uh, he, Wayne Newton hired him personally to train his Arabian horses. If you remember, he used to train nothing but Arabian. He had nothing but Arabian horses, mm -hmm. Wayne in Las Vegas. I knew him because he used to show here in Ohio all the time. Bob, uh, can't remember his name either now. But anyway, he, uh, he moved. I used to talk to him when he was in Las Vegas, asking him different little information, and he would tell it. A fellow named Stanley White that worked for some big guy in Detroit named Ford. He might have been related to the Fords. I don't know. But he trained, uh, he had Arabian horses. He, he uh, wanted to meet Stanley White who was an Arab. I got him mixed up with the other Sam. Yeah, his last name was White. And uh, anyway, he was a big horse trainer. And I met him at the horse shows. And I really picked his brains because he was good. You know, there's a psychology for a horse, he said. You show him what you want him to do. Like the horse whisperer. But you don't just say, uh, it was a kind of a different method. He restrained them. A horse learns by reward and punishment, really. Not punishment with a whip, but punishment even with a bit. That's punishment in his mouth. When you let up on it, it's not punishment. And that's the method he used. Reward and punishment. But not punishment the way people think. Punishment? No, you don't want to punish an animal. But anything that restrains them is punishment, see? And that's the theory he goes by. Like a bit. You pull on a horse's mouth, you put a little pressure on his mouth, that's uncomfortable. You teach him how to respond to the bit, how to flex his head back and forward, see? And when he knows that pressure first hits his mouth, if you taught him right, when that lays on the bars and hits his mouth, his head goes like that. He knows he don't want that bit hard on his mouth. And when you see a person always pulling on a horse, pulling on, he makes him very hard mouth. And you can pull on his mouth and he'll be started down the street 90 miles an hour and you can't stop him because you're pulling on those hard bars and he ain't stopping. But if you got it where you can take your fingertips and do that, and then your pressure comes from here. I used to take my <coughs> bridle off of my horse just to demonstrate him and guide him with my legs because I've taught him pressure with my legs. I could, I would take it off, put it up around his head, not over oh, front of his head, around his neck, and hold on to it. Just hold it, and I could circle and lunge him right around this yard with me on his back. And I did it by legs. I could stop him. I stopped him by sitting deep in the saddle, squeezing, and kind of go back with my backside. You know, <laughs> come right to the stop. See. Wow. You can squeeze if he wants to run away with him when you want him to canter. You can stop him, Whoa. back him up a few steps, start him out again to canter nice and easy like you want. If he starts to get pulley or runny, stop him. I don't care if you have to do it a hundred times. Back him up again, but don't do it regular. Do it at different spots. And then walk him off again, strike him off again, walk him off again, or can it. That's how you can calm him down. Pretty soon he'll get where you'll sit there, boy, and he'll just go. And he'll walk, walk, and you say the word, walk. And you say the word, trot. And you don't say a whole lot of words. Walk, trot, <coughs> canter. But you're also, you know yeah, you're, also, you're also doing your pressures with your bit and with your legs. And that's how you train a good horse and how so many people ruin a good horse. Yeah. You make him dangerous by not knowing what you're doing. And you should learn, either read while you're learning or go to somebody that you know knows how to train a horse. Yeah. 
and I read and went to both of them. I went to college, I always said, well, horse college. training. So yeah, I, did, was, I didn't. That was your way out of the detective unit to go to the I knew horses. Unit? Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to, uh, wanted to ride, and you look good. <laughs> you draw attention. Yeah. You didn't have to, just a presence. Yeah. They say, what good is a horse in traffic? I could ride downtown, and people could see me, and they'd notice me. If a guy was getting ready to do something, he said, he don't know that where I'm at. He said, wait a minute, there's a cop around here. And that makes a big difference. You're aware, you're, you're there, you're a parent. That's why it's good to patrol when you're in a district all the time. Don't just sit one place or two places. You patrol the district right. and you're seen. He never knows where you're at and where you're going to pop up. Right. That's it. So that's, that w that's very exciting to mm -hmm. uh, be able to move around in the police course the way you have. You did oh, the yeah. walking beach, you did the car, and the mounted police. When you retired, where were you? Where the hell was I? Oh, they moved me back to basic patrol. The police chiefs changed, uh -huh. and they didn't know me and didn't say that, and they said, hey, this guy's malcontent. I know that's why they did it, because uh, they moved me back. I into the basic patrol. And that's, I retired in basic patrol. I worked it for a while, but uh, in 77. Tell me, were you there when Carl Stokes was elected? No. You Came right? in after. Okay. Yeah. But they, uh, wait a minute. I was there when he first got in. I think he was elected in 77. Yeah. Because some guy asked me did I want to be in his protective group. Mm -hmm. and I said no. Because they traveled around, you know. And I had been, oh, I had been in public relations too. And in public relations, I knew I had to get out of there because all they did, if you went somewhere to talk over a subject, you go there and everybody talks and drinks coffee and talk like we're doing here. And uh, about after a half hour or better of talking, you're just going there with plain clothes. You're in plain clothes. Uh, they get down to a subject, you know. And you didn't get anything. I didn't think. I didn't think. No, maybe I was wrong. That's me. He really didn't get anything done. He didn't get down to the truth of it because you didn't, if you told the truth or if you talked like I talked, at that time they were thinking, the time they were thinking about black kids don't understand from the ghetto because they don't talk very with English. They sort of the bionics was beginning to come in, okay. you know. And we have a teacher that can have good. Rep well, you know what, my statement, I didn't say it in what's the name, but I did say it in the picture. I said, they don't teach bionics on Wall Street. I said, teach them to talk right. Or they don't teach that broken language, teach them what they're supposed to know. Yeah. It, instead of saying that, stop them. Say that, because most of them are from people from the Deep South that talk that way. Mm -hmm. and, and some people didn't, you know. But a lot of people didn't have what the Northerners called the proper pronunciation, they either said them, that, you know, a lot of the people that were, what they called the field hands or whatever they call them, call them you know, right. yeah, and didn't have the education. But they still, I'm not talking about their southern accent now. I'm talking about the way they pronounced the word, mm -hmm. them or that, mm -hmm. these are those, you know, sure. So what made you move out here? Because I'll always, oh, and he, we'll talk he about won't. Here, he, here where we are, this is beautiful out here. Well, I said I was a country boy yeah. at heart. Yeah. And where's we, Willoughby? And uh, at first I moved out to Wick, Wycliffe, mm -hmm. and I put me a corral in the back. That's where I had my first horse. Oh, my <laughs> People were, didn't think you could put one. They had no law against it. Yeah. I was the first one wow. from the old days to put one there, and they couldn't put me out. Right, right. <laughs> and, and old man, uh, I forgot his name. He had ponies. 
he did have ponies, and he was into politics down there for years. And uh, but then I think they made a law after that. I think that you couldn't keep it. I could keep mine because I was grandfathered in. You know how that goes. And uh, yeah. And then we moved here because I wanted ponies, kids, and I had a pony and a horse down there. As a matter of fact, I had my horse, first horse that I bought, and then I had a bigger horse. It was it was a young horse. I trained it. Then we had uh, an older horse, a Palomina, that I rode because I still wanted to ride, and mine was too young to ride. And then we had a pony in the backyard down there. Did you ever go to our house and? You know, I think I remember. It was really I had a big. corral in the backyard that went out. Yeah. And I used to tie a rubber tire on the back of my old Palomino that I rode and just let him go around grass. I didn't even have the corral built at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would walk around the yard there and eat his grass with the rubber tire on a rope tied behind him till one time he made a quick move. And that rubber tire hit him in his backside and jumped up. It bounced and hit him and he didn't know what hit him. The last I saw him, <laughs> That's why I made sure I started that corral there after that. The last time I saw him, he was hit it with that tar bouncing him at every step. Up past the churchyard, into Route 84, across the road, Ridge Road. And I said, oh, God. Because I just had pictures of him hitting a car, running through somebody's house, running over somebody's kid. I said, should I own up to him? But everybody knew I had that old. So you went and got him. I got him, and he didn't hit a thing. He ran through people's yard, but he didn't. It was a novelty to them. <laughs> they look up and see a horse coming through there <laughs> with a tire hitting him in his head. <laughs> I never got sighted or anything else about it, but I sure the hell built that fence. <laughs> but, so that's when we moved up here, and that was in 19... 70. Yeah, and uh, we, we didn't move in here at first because this was not here. Back and the, was it? No, this back part. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And this barn only had one side to it. Well, they had a whole side to it, but it was leaning. And that side was kind of leaning and falling down, like, see, the barn that you take down there. And I decided to tear that part down, leave this new part that I had built on this side. Mm -hmm. That was built by professionals on this side. Mm -hmm. The sanding, but turn the rest, of, tear all the rest of it down. And I tore it all down bit by bit and burned it right out there in the yard. Mm -hmm. We say they've probably put me under the jail now, under the jail, not over the jail. <laughs> and and um, uh, built that, I built that section on that side to even it up. And that's when Sue got married. Okay. She married a fellow from California and they came here and got married. Uh -huh. All of California damn there was here. <laughs> yeah. And that was, oh, that was, that wedding been talked about for years. Because we had a big tent over there, chairs. We had a couple of latrines. One lady, her husband, she couldn't find him. They were ready to go home. And she couldn't find her shoes. She had a pair of red shoes. I found them later. And we finally found her husband. He was in the latrine asleep. <laughs> oh, it was quite a party. Cars were parked. I couldn't get in all over the yard, couldn't get up and down. Well, you could get through, yeah. but on the pass, three or four houses up. <laughs> cars were up there. People had to leave and walk up to their cars and things like that. That party went. Just what, a, just what, a, what, um, about what, the daybreak. Let me, let me just pop around a little bit more. Okay. I, I think I remember you traveling across country on a horse. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. Well, that's when my wife said, 
I marched to the tune of a different drummer. I said, I'm not the first person to do that. And she said, yeah, but you're going to ride across country on a horse. I said, yeah, I was retired. And I, was, I had a job on the, uh, with the horse, uh, harness horse people. And I had quit that after my boy got killed. I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. I said, because uh, uh, Dave and I always said we were going to go across country. But I was trying to think. Before then, though, I went across on a motorcycle. Yeah, that was in uh, around 89, I think, somewhere in there. And I rode all the way through, up through Yellowstone Park, up through Deadwood, where Gen Deadwood, up through there, where General Custer, Badlands, where he got killed. Long 90 up there. Over. Hey, you guys. Okay. Right, take care. Okay. I'll stop up. I'll see you. But anyway, they uh, through there, and. Uh, No, either, I yeah, either I'm uh, getting ahead of myself there, or uh, no, I didn't go up into Deadwood there. I just crossed across uh, 